This teaching is going to be on the tabernacle. Tabernacle, temple. It was a tabernacle and then they built a temple. Solomon built a temple. But the tabernacle was a tent that the, that Israel, the Jews, would move with them as they were going through the wilderness. So we're going to learn about this tabernacle. But I, before I get started, I'm going to start from the very beginning here and show you sacrifices. The sacrifices they were doing in the tabernacle, they were being done from the beginning of time. So that's where we're going to start. In the beginning, God created man in his own image, right? That's what it says in Genesis 1.26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So Adam and Eve were sinless. Because we they were, they were made in the likeness of the Lord, right? So they were sinless until the devil came along. They had just eaten from the tree that God told them not to eat from, from the beginning. And this was the first sin in the Bible. Their eyes were open and they saw that they were naked. How did they know they were naked? God never told them they were naked. They never looked at it as being sin or, or wrong. But as soon as their eyes were open to sin, they realized they were naked. And in chapter 1, chapter 1, God is blessing them. In chapter 1. And just three chapters later, God's cursing the ground. So in three chapters, man, the fools that we are, in three chapters, we got away from the Lord. In three chapters. Not three books. Three chapters. That's how quick we got away from God. The Lord chastised them by, because of their disobedience, and He kicked them out of the garden. When the Lord came looking for them, they covered themselves, their nakedness, they covered with fig leaves. And God showed them this wasn't pleasing to Him. It took more than leaves to cover their sin. There had to be death, just like Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. Adam and Eve, they covered their sin. Well, at least they thought they were covering their sins with, with, with leaves. And God said, no, no, no. In Genesis 3.21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, up until now, there was no killing of animals. Animals didn't kill each other. Up until now, all the, animal, all the animals ate grass. So the animals weren't killing each other, and men were not killing animals. But here, right here, it says the Lord covered them with the blood of an animal. So he had to kill, he had to sacrifice an animal. For what? Because of their sin. Because of their sin. He had, it had to be blood. That's why he covered them with the blood of an animal. And I want y'all to make, y'all, make sure y'all understand, there was no blood shed up until this point. So, like I said, this was the first blood sacrifice in the Bible. And it's just like he supplied the blood for Adam and Eve back then. That's what he did with us, with Jesus. He supplied, he, he supplied us a blood sacrifice, and that was his son. So, just like he did it with Adam and Eve, he did it with us. Now, let's see the series of sacrifice to the Lord. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. It says, Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, The Lord has produced a man in me. Make sure we see see what that says. Who produced the man in her? The Lord. So who makes babies? Did she say, Adam gave me a baby? No. She said, The Lord produced in me a man. And we're killing him. God makes him and we kill him. That's a big reason I don't like being belong, belonging to this country because we build, kill babies by the millions. When y'all pray, you need to pray for this country. Not for revival because it's not going to happen. But what we need to do, if you know anybody who's thinking about abortion, you need to, you need to introduce Jesus to them. Because just maybe, just maybe, they'll change their mind. But I'm just showing here with this one verse, God makes babies. And if, if you have women out there who can't get pregnant, we all have some kind of sickness. We all have. And now, you're not, whoever's out there and they can't have babies, I don't understand. I don't know why. 
but I know the Lord makes babies. There's got to be a reason. I don't understand it, and whoever's out there in that situation, y'all probably don't understand it. But there's a lot of things I don't understand what the Lord does. But I know it's His way. And I know He makes babies. Amen. Verse 2. Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. And <clears throat> excuse me. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd. And while Cain cultivated the ground, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as an offering, offering to the Lord. Abel also brought an offering, the best of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his offering, but he did not accept Cain and his offering. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Now this was the first argument in the Bible, was over religion. His offering, your offering. You understand? This guy wanted to offer this, and this brother offered this, and this brother offered this, and only one of them was pleasing to the Lord. But we, like I said, we have that today. The first murder, because we'll see that Cain murdered Abel, was over religion. We're doing that today. Brothers here in, in, this, in this country today we live in, we don't kill each other, but we sure badmouth each other. This religion will badmouth that religion. Now overseas, they are killing each other. Religions are killing each other. Especially those against Christianity. Christianity is a hated religion because the world is not of God. All these religions that are of the world, they hate God. And they hate anybody who lives for them. And that's why Christianity is, is the most populated uh, persecution of Christians. We know that by looking overseas. In verse 6, Why are you so angry? The Lord, the Lord asks Cain. Why do you look so dejected? Again, again, the Lord says, Why are you so angry? Why do you look this way? Cain and Abel had learned from Adam about offerings from the Lord. You might ask, well, how do you know they learned about offerings? Well, because Adam was the father of them two. He was the head of the house. And what does the head of the house do? They teach the way of the Lord. Adam knew all this, and he said, I know without a doubt he taught his sons. That's what we do. We teach our children. And Hebrews 11.4 says... That Abel brought his offering by faith. And in Romans 10, 17, it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So where did Abel hear this? Abel's faith was in what Adam, his father, taught him about offerings. So he heard his father tell him this because it says in hearing by the word of God. So Adam told him the word of God. And God asked, like I said, God asked Ang uh, Cain, why are you angry? You see, when we do things our way and God doesn't accept it, we get mad. We get upset with the Lord. You'd be surprised how many people get upset with the Lord because they're thinking they're doing something right and thinking, I'm sure this is pleasing to the Lord. And we'll see why Cain thought his was more pleasing than Abel's. But when we do it our way, we get angry when God doesn't accept it. And this is what happened to Cain here. 1 John 3.12 we must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So who was following the Lord and who wasn't? The one who killed wasn't following the Lord. The one who did get killed was following the Lord. And what's the Bible say? We will be prosecuted. They've been doing it since the beginning of time. And they're still doing, it, still doing it today. Just like I said, they're killing Christians in overseas. Verse 8. One day Cain suggested to his brother, Let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Cain was jealous of his brother because he was a shepherd. Back in them days, a shepherd had an had a easy job to do. Because like I said, back then... Animals weren't eating animals. Lions weren't, weren't, they were not attacking lambs. All the animals ate grass. So he had an easy job to do. All he had to do was make sure 
They stayed in their little group and didn't go running off somewhere. That's all Shepherd had to do. And by the way, the, the, the lamb, see if I can say this nicely, but the sheep is the dumbest animal on earth. The sheep have no sense. They're, they know they're, they're just there eating. <laughs> That's all they do. I'm serious. You, know, you, you can ask just about anybody. They'll tell you the dumbest animal on, on earth is probably the lamb, the sheep. That's where you know God has a sense of humor. <laughs> so, when God said He's the shepherd and we're the sheep, what's He telling us? Okay, dummies. But when you put it that way. <laughs> okay, dummies. And it, I mean, it's true, ain't it? Yeah. How many? How many people accept the Word of God and how many people don't? Right. So, I, I can understand the Lord calling the sheep. Because most of the people do not even, don't even know what he's saying. Don't understand him. So like I said, when, when he said, I'm the shepherd and you're my sheep, well, amen. We look at it as him saying we're his children. <laughs> yeah. We're not looking at it as, I know we're dummies. <laughs> you ain't going to point it out. But, but I, I did want to point that out. <laughs> Abel's job was very easy. I mean, he didn't have to worry about bears and tire lions and all that attacking, attacking the sheep. All he had to make sure was they stayed in the group and was in the right place. Now, Cain, on the other hand, was a farmer. He had to till the ground. He had to really work. Because in Genesis 3.17, God told Adam, the man, curse is the ground. So, because of Adam's sin, he said, Adam, because you sin, now you're going to have to work for a living. That's why he said, cursed is the ground. Adam, you have to work for a living now. And because they, uh, Cain worked so hard, he thought his offering would be more pleasing than Abel's. Because Abel's was such an easy job. But Abel offered what? Blood. Cain offered his, his uh, produce. Fruit from the land. It's more pleasing to him, to the Lord, to obey his words than for you to do what you think is better. Amen? We have to learn that. Because I'm telling you, I see it, and I usually do it myself. Well, if I do it this way, I, I know it's good. Oh, wait, wait a minute, what did God say? No. So God rejected his, uh, his offering. In fact, it even says that in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. It says, It is more pleasing to him for us to obey and to submit to him than to reject his command and be rebellious and do it our way. First, First Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. That's a good verse. God turned down Cain's offering just like he turned down Adam's covering of sin. God turned down his father's covering, the leaves. God turned that down. He said, no, no, that's not pleasing to me. And now he's turning down Cain's offering and saying, no, I do not accept that. It doesn't matter what we do. God gave his son to die for us. He did it while we were yet sinners. So if we're trying to please God, to impress Him or please Him, when you become a Christian, you walk with Him. And that's automatically going to please Him. You walk with Him. You do His will. That's what pleases God. As far as us trying to, trying to get Him to love us more, how much more can He love us? He gave His Son while we were yet sinners. How much more can He love us? You understand what I'm saying? In Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Wickedness spread throughout the land. Violence grew, and there was no fellowship between God and man. It got real bad. God's judgment came down on their wickedness, and he destroyed everyone except Noah and his family. So from Cain to Abel, it just got so bad, it got to Noah, and, and God said, I had enough. I'm going to save those who are righteous to save and destroy everybody else. And it just so happened that Noah and his family was the only ones that were righteous with God. Again, why? Who was the head of the house? Noah. Noah, Noah taught his wife and his children God's ways to live for the Lord. He taught them the righteous way to live, to be righteous. And that's why they were the only ones who got saved during the flood. See how important the job of 
not the job, the, the ministry of the husband is, the father, it's very important. Because of these men, uh, Noah and Adam, well, he tried, one of his sons went the other way, but Abel listened. Abel was right with the Lord. Noah's sons was right with the Lord. Because Adam and Noah, they were righteous men. Adam sinned, but he was a righteous man. He taught to his sons God's ways, just like Noah did here. So if you're, if you're, if you're a father, you need to lead your children. Teach your children all the ways of the Lord. And this is what happens. The Bible plainly says, it says, Raise a, raise a child in the way he should go, and when he grows old, he will not depart from it. When you read that verse, you got to read it as God saying, Hey, I promise you, you raise your children in the way they should go. I promise you, when they get old, they will not depart from it. This is a promise. God made this promise. So can we trust it? Can we believe it? Mm -hmm. Amen. Again, why was Noah and his family spared? It tells us in Genesis 7.1 And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Because he saw Noah as being righteous, and his, and his family followed. But since he destroyed the earth, and now starting over with Noah and his family, he tells them some things that he told Adam and Eve. Because it's starting all over now. He told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. Well, he's telling Noah now, in Genesis 9-1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He's saying, I had to destroy it because of their wickedness. But now I want you to replenish it. The first thing Noah did when he got on dry land is he built an altar. In Genesis 9 no, excuse me, in Genesis 8.20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offering on the altar. So I'm, I'm pointing all this stuff all the way from Genesis, before I get to the tabernacle, to show you about the altar, and the offerings, the blood offerings. So when we get to the tabernacle, you'll have a little better understanding of what's going on. Now these things were still the same, as far as the generation, they were wicked also. But the people were even worse than before. Because they got together and in Genesis 11.4, they said, Let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Because, God, because of that, God brought judgment on them. What did man want to do? They wanted to make another way to heaven. Let's make our way to heaven the way we want to go there. And let us make another name. They even wanted to make another name for themselves. And believe me, there's a lot of names here on earth right now that people are living by. And it's not the name of Jesus. It's not Jehovah God. But it's another name. And one of them, this is why nobody's going to like me, but one of them is Mary. People think they're going to get to heaven by Mary. It's not going to happen. Read the Bible. In Genesis 11.9 Therefore is the name of it called Babel because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. <clears throat> and, from, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So like I said, the, the Lord brought judgment on them and He gave everybody different language. Nobody... The, the bricklayer couldn't understand the, the woodworker. Or, you know, they, they, were all, they were lost. They couldn't work together because they couldn't understand each other. So that was it. They couldn't build that tower. As time went on, after that, Abram, Abraham came into the story. And God made another covenant with him. God has a special presence with Abraham. And he tells him in Genesis 12 too, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee. And make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And then in Genesis 15, 8, it says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thee, I have given this land from the river of Egypt unto the river, unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the promised land. Because of this covenant, God changes Abram's name to Abraham, 
which we learned that in the blood covenant, that God changes the name. He changed our name. Our name, our title is Christian now. Christian Jesse or Jesse Christian, however you want to say it. He was righteous because God told him to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And what made him righteous was he was ready to sacrifice his son as an offering to God. God said it and he was going to do it. Do we obey the Lord that way? Just ask yourself, don't say, don't say anything. Just, But do we obey God all the way to even if he was asked us to sacrifice somebody in our family, son, whatever, would we do it? Don't say you can't, because if Adam can, I mean, Abraham could, what are, we, are we any different from Abraham? He was in the flesh, just like we're in the flesh, but he obeyed God. Can we do what Abraham was ready to do? Just ask yourself that, because if the answer isn't the one you would like to answer, have, then maybe we just, just maybe we need to get a little closer to the Lord, because the Lord does say in the Bible, you put your mother, your father, your daughter, your brother, your anybody. If you put anybody for me, the Lord says you're not fit for me. If Jesus, if if the Lord isn't number one, number one in your life, then He's no part of you. Man, Jesse, I didn't know all this. When I gave my life to the Lord, I thought, oh, I go give my life to the Lord and go to church. No, no. There's a lot more to. And giving your life to the Lord than what they preach or teach. The Bible says He wants all of you. And He wants to be number one in your life. And it even it says it. I should have got the verses, but I didn't. Sorry. But it does say in the Bible that we are to be before our relatives. Even if it's your father or mother. Now in Genesis 22, 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket of by his horns and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son all the way back then we had to have sacrifices what did the Lord do what did God do he was testing Abraham did Abraham pass the test amen he did if God puts me to the test I pray that I would pass it God already knew God already knew God knows everything but he was showing Abraham how strong his faith was in God. That's what he was doing, showing Abraham. Now I'm going to show you how Israel ended up as slaves in Egypt. As I'm, just, I'm going through all this history real quick to get to the tabernacle. Just showing you how they, way back then, before the tabernacle, there were sacrifices. Now God changed Jacob's name to Israel, part of the covenant. God visited Jacob in a dream and he told him some promises. The same promises he gave to Abraham, he was going to give to him also. And Jacob had 12 sons and his favorite son was Joseph. It says that in Genesis 37.3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. And his brothers knew that. So his brothers took him out, threw him in the pit, and sold him as a slave. That's how much they hated him. They were... They wanted to kill him, but they ended up uh, selling him as a slave. See what hatred can do? Yeah. See what happens when you don't walk with the Lord? Hatred. Even to your own brother. This was their brother. Blood. And they hated him. Once Satan gets a hold of you, and we're going to see that further down. Once he gets a hold of you, little by little, that sin will grow. Even when you say... Something about a, a sin, oh, that was just, that's just a little sin. There is no little sin. Sin is sin in God's eyes. Sin is sin. And the Bible says sin will grow. It starts off little, but it will grow. It grew so much into these brothers, they sold their brother to slavery. Genesis 37, 38, I mean 28. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, that... And they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Israelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now because the Lord was with Joseph, Joseph loved the Lord. He was just like his father. He loved the Lord. And because Joseph was close to the Lord, his brothers meant bad for him. But what ended, what, what ended up with Joseph? How did he come out of this? 
he became a ruler. <laughs> I mean, they meant it for bad, but God turned it around to good. Right. Amen? Amen? So when that thing, when, it, when these things happen to us and we're like, we're being prosecuted for whatever, God can easily and does turn it around for your good. Amen. In fact, I've got a teaching on it. And I don't have the slightest idea what the title of the teaching <laughs> is. I think it's called When Satan Attacks, I think. But I, I, I teach this right here. Now in Genesis 39, verse 2 through 4. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptians. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and served him, and he made him overseers over his house and all that he had he put into his hands so we, we see that all what happened to Joseph was he prospered out of that his brothers wanted to kill him and he became a very famous famous man and then because of the famine they had throughout the land there Joseph his brothers and his father were going hungry so they went to uh, where he to where Joseph was in Egypt. They didn't know Joseph was, was right under the king. They got there and they found out he was right under the king. And so they went over there and of course Joseph fed them, gave them food, and they ended up staying there. But God told Israel, told Jacob before he left, Genesis 46 verses 2 through 4, And God spoke unto Israel in the vision of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. And I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thy eyes. This is how Israel ended up in Egypt. And when God told Jacob, I will surely bring thee up again, he was telling them that he wouldn't die in Egypt. Jacob didn't want to die in Egypt. He wanted to die with his, he wanted to be buried where his fathers were. In Genesis 47, verses 29 and 30. And the time drew night that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. So Joseph fulfilled what God had promised Israel. God told, told Jacob, you're not going to die in Egypt. You're going to die where you want to die. And this is what Joseph did. I'm just showing that God answers. When God tells you something, he's going to do it. He's going to die, just what I'm showing you here. He did, well, he did bury his father with his fathers. Now time went on, and Joseph and his brothers died. They were in Egypt a good while. And during that time, Joseph and his brothers died. Exodus 1, verse 6 through 9. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly and multiplied, and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now remember what God told Israel in Genesis 2-3, that He would make him a great nation? Well, they're becoming a great nation here. They, kept, they, became, they multiplied and they became mighty. I just, like, I just like to read every time God says something, and then later on when you see that He fulfilled it, Amen. <laughs> He, I mean, any word you see God making a promise in the Bible, you might not see it in that chapter. You might not see it for maybe books down the way. But he'll, it'll, it'll, it'll be shown. Right. That's right. God told him over here that he was going to have a mighty nation. Over here, this, this is when it happened. So when you're reading, when the Lord says meditate on him day and night, you're, this is what you meditate on. I remember this over here. I don't know what it meant yet, but I know he said this. And you just keep on reading. Just keep on reading and you'll see the fulfillment by God. Verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. 
And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Oh, that's not good. Here's a king and he's seeing these people that he, he doesn't remember why they were brought here. He doesn't remember who Joseph is. All he knows is he's seeing this nation becoming mighty. So in verse 11, the Egyptians made Israel, the Israelites, slaves. They were still big enough and powerful enough to take control over them. So this is how Israel became slaves to Egypt. There was a man called Moses who God used to set his people free. God showed his power in judgment when he brought many plagues onto Egypt. God told the children of Israel to sacrifice an animal which would, be, which would save the firstborn because the last plague was God was going to kill all the firstborn. So God told them to sacrifice an animal and to take the blood and to swipe it over the door and on the sides. And that's how the Passover came along. Because when, when the angel came along, he saw that blood, he would pass over that house. He knew it was the house of God. But you had to have that blood. Without that blood, the angel would have killed the people in that family. Y'all hear me? Without the blood. We're going to learn a whole lot about the blood and how important it is. But right here, when they say the Passover, the Passover is when the death angel would go pass over the house that had blood on the doors. Amen? Amen. In Exodus 3.8, And I am come down to deliver thee out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. With his mighty hand, God delivered his people from Egypt. Now, while they were fleeing from Egypt, the Israels, the, the Israelites, they were fleeing. They saw an army of well over 600 men. And here they are, slaves, looking with their fleshly eyes. They see this army coming at them. They see that there's a Red Sea right there. They're trapped. But like always, like always, and still today, they forget who God is. God told them back then, and He tells us today, to what? To stand. Whatever problem you see, stand. Put your faith in me, put your trust in me, and stand. I will take care of this problem. But did Israel do that? No, they panicked. They wanted to kill Moses. What did God do? He opened the Red Sea. Amen. They gave themselves no hope. Yeah. They thought that was it. But they forgot who their father was. They forgot the covenant between God and Abraham, between God and Moses. They forgot all that. And he panicked. And he brought them safely through the Red Sea. And he killed the Egyptian army. About 600 chariots were drowned, covered by the sea. He took them from being slaves to a false god to being servants to a true god. He did this. They saw it. And if I was ever to teach the Old Testament, most of it would be teaching how the Jews were always forgetting who God was. Always. But like I've said always before, we can't really down them. Because we do exactly the same thing. We get sick. Ooh, I better go to the doctor. We don't have enough, pay, enough money this payday. Ooh, how are we going to pay the bills? Leave it to the Lord. Trust in God. Trust in God. Believe me, trust in Him. All of a sudden, you got money from somewhere. I mean... God knows how to get you money. If you need money, He's going to take care of it. He will take care of it. It's happened to me. He will take care of it. No matter what it is. It doesn't matter what... Is there anything for God to handle? If there is, then I need another God. But He's not. There's nothing too big for God to handle. Again, I don't know how many times I'm going to say this, but I'm going to have to say it this many times so it will sink into our heads that God is God we are people. He takes care of us. We just need to trust in Him completely. A hundred percent. We as Christians, that's something we definitely need to learn how to do. Is trust in our God. Now, this was God's way of living among the sinful people that we are. This is the beginning of the tabernacle. 
while traveling to the promised land, while Israel was traveling to the promised land, the Lord had Moses go up into the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And while he was up there, while he was up there, I believe he gave him the blueprint of the tabernacle. The Lord did, did give it to him. I'm just saying I think he gave it to him when he got the Ten Commandments also. But he did give them to him because in Exodus 25.9 it says, According to all that I showed thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So he did give uh, Moses the blueprint, the plans for the tabernacle. I think and, he says he gave him the blueprints. Like and this is where it started. I mean, this is, this is how the tabernacle got started with Moses. The Lord gave him the blueprints. And this tabernacle, inside the tabernacle, the tabernacle itself and everything, everything inside the tabernacle represents Jesus. We're going to see that everything in that tabernacle represents Jesus. What did Jesus say in the New Testament? He said, everything in the Old Testament concerns me. Jesus said, everything in the Old Testament is about me. So do we need the, uh, the Old Testament? Right. Heck yeah. It's all about Jesus. And this is the tabernacle. It's all gonna, we're going to see that every, everything in the tabernacle represented the Lord. God chose His desire to, to be with us. He wanted to dwell with us, with His creation. He wanted to have a, la a relationship with us. And He could only approach us with our repentance, which means our cleansing. We need to be cleansed. And how do we get cleansed? Through the Word. And through the blood. That's how that's I'm gonna keep talking about the blood because it's we need the blood to be cleansed. We need to be washed. And we're gonna learn all about that. Sin was serious, very seer, serious. And like I said, only blood could uh, pay for it. Which we most of us already know that, but I'm gonna show a lot more into detail about that. Now this was God's way of living among sinful people, because it says in Isaiah fifty nine two but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. This study will show us how Almighty God cares so much for us, he made a plan for us, that he can have fellowship with us. We couldn't see him, but we can have fellowship with him. The tabernacle, like I said, was a movable tent. It's something that they put together, and when they moved, they would take it up and move it. And God gave the instructions to Moses and gave him precise instructions. I mean, Moses had to follow it to the T. To the T. And he did. Moses did. But we're going to see further along, we're going to see what happens to someone who doesn't follow what God said to do. We'll see. That'll be later. Now, there was a fence around the tabernacle. And that fence was put there for the people that were on the outside. Because we're going to find out that people who came in the tabernacle unworthy would die. So God made a fence around the tabernacle to keep people out. We're going to find that out. And inside the tab tabernacle they had priests and they had a high priest. They were the only ones who could go inside the tabernacle. And then inside the tabernacle they had three sections. They had the courtyard, which at the main gate of the tabernacle, this is where the Israelites would bring their sacrifices and their offerings. And the priests would receive, would, they would receive the offering and they would bless the people. Also inside the courtyard, they had a bronze altar and a bronze lever, which was a water basin. Then they had another tent, split in two. One side of the tent was called the holy place. It had three objects all, uh, in there. It was the golden lamp. It was the table of bread of precincts and the altar of incense. That was inside the holy place. And then on the other side of the veil from the holy place was called the most holy place or the holy of holies. That's where no man but the high priest could go in. And the only thing in there was the Ark of the Covenant. And I will teach what was in that, in the Ark of the Covenant. The tabernacle was in Jerusalem, and the people were faithful to, to perform their sacrifices to God, so they could be protected by Him. See, they knew 
if they followed God's instructions, they could they would be protected by Him. Just like we know, if we follow Him, walk with Him, He will protect us. And at this time, that's what what the Jews were doing. But if the people, like I say, if the people would offer a lame or a sick animal as a sacrifice to God instead of their best, people were defiling the altar and they were despising God. By doing that, you were despising God. That's in Malachi chapter 1, verse 7 through 14, if you want to read about that. But you, you better bring the right sacrifice. Because what happens when you despise God? It's not a good thing. You don't want to despise God. So we're going to learn the duties of the high priest. We're going to learn the duties of the priest. And all, what all these objects, that, that picture you have, all those options, you, objects that you see in that picture, every one of them, is I'm going to teach on. And, and what they mean.